We're kind of settling in. How are we doing? Uh, my name is Tom LaRusso. This is Lauren White. We are here from Xbox Research. Very excited to be talking to you about guidelines for inclusive and accessible games. Yes, that is a little different than the title and the program because we changed it at the last minute, uh, you know, literally up to the last minute. So just a quick word on who we are. Lauren and I are on Xbox Research. We work on the platform side. So Xbox Research is games plus the platform. So we work on all the experiences on an Xbox that are not a game. So all social, collection, store, all those kind of things. Uh, we're doing a lot on PC and mobile as well. So all the gaming experiences you have, uh, we work and cover a lot of those. Now, one of the focuses of the last couple of years has been looking at inclusivity and accessibility. It's been a great learning experience for us. We've done a lot of studies, uh, lab studies, surveys, interviews, a lot of expert review, a lot of lit review on this topic over the last couple of years, both as part of our you know, kind of main job and then also as a side job because we're just very interested in it. Uh, and so when we talk about inclusive and accessibility, we're really talking about this. People with a different levels of ability, hearing, speech, and all that that we're gonna go into uh, much longer. So some of the goals for this talk, we wanna, give you some, first some insights about sort of the space, how to think about the audience, how to think about doing research and product development when we look at people with different abilities. Uh, so I'm gonna talk on that. Lauren's gonna come up and give some specific guidelines on how to improve your game, share some of the things we've learned, both from the platform and the games. Also, honestly, from Office, from Windows, it's a big push around Microsoft. So we have a lot of learnings that we can help, hopefully will be useful for you in your games. Uh, we want to give you some of the tools and some of the language to have these discussions when you go back to work on your projects, um, both to do the research and also to talk to your product teams. And of course, we're up here, we're excited, so we hope to get you guys excited so you actually want to go back. We want to show you some of the value for doing this kind of research as well. So I've got about six or seven kind of insights that we've learned about the audience. And the first one, you could even see it right in the title, talking about inclusive and accessible. So you'll hear us use those interchangeably. Most times you're talking about this, you're talking about accessibility. And really, the way we think about that is you've got your experience, you've got your game, you've designed it for your core set of users, it's great, it's working well, and then if you have time and if you have the money and if you have the buy-in, you get to say, okay, great, now I have to think about how is this game gonna be used by someone with low vision or with low hearing? Let me go tweak some setting or enable a high contrast mode or something like that. And that's great, like we don't mind that. There's nothing bad with that. We do a lot of that in Xbox as well. What we're trying to do is push more towards inclusive design. You can think about that as universal design. And that's really all about getting earlier in the design process. So thinking about my core set of users, but then also broadening that even in the design and the spec phase. How are all my users gonna use that? We could talk about this for an hour, but I've actually got a short five minute video. Um, it's from what we call an inclusive design sprint. So in order to try to get the team thinking about these types of people earlier, people with these types of abilities that you can see, um, the design team brought a bunch of PMs, designers, devs into a room for a few days and really did a deep dive on this topic of accessibility and inclusivity. And then we made a lovely video about it, both to help with the product team and improve the product and also to build empathy throughout the company. So hopefully, Work. An inclusive design sprint case study, Xbox Social Gaming, with August de los Reyes. As a design director for Xbox, we decided to focus on gamers, and particularly deaf and hard of hearing gamers. Gamers are no longer just entertainment. They're a vital part of sort of society at large. Giving an, an opportunity to share my experience with other people who are going to take this and uh, hopefully turn this into something that's really useful for me and for other people who have my disability as well. Accessibility is not the goal of inclusive design, but rather observing how people with different levels of ability navigate a typical situation and use that analog as a starting point for designing our features. It really isn't about designing for people with disabilities. It's really just about a design process that meets everyone's needs. Coming here and talking about Xbox, because that was the point of the discussion, it seems, however, the discussion was everything else outside of Xbox. My favorite part so far has been uh, the inclusion of the subject matter experts. 
you hear their story, you feel their story in context of their, as them as a person, in a way that you don't get in text on a forum or on a, a user voice. Some of the inclusive design tools um, were really helpful to help me think about like different slices of the experience. We've got this basic idea that, that makes a lot of sense. We have it kind of frame by frame. You know, thinking about someone that is doing something on a bus. What if, in fact, we transport that to another location? And so running that through a couple of different um, places, whether it be uh, in transit. Someone that has um, a different type of ability that is in a different context in their life. Well, this is kind of an edge case, or this is only a couple of people who might benefit from this thing. Uh, you know, in all actuality, it is, it is a lot, a lot of people, and so uh, there, there is kind of inherent value in those things as well. The one thing that I would want to come out of this would just be a different way of approaching how you actually start the design process, rather than starting out in that like tunnel development phase where you're just, you know, generating this just for an Xbox One player, um, but just thinking outside of the box and make sure that it is um, inclusive to everyone. And so I just really tried to impress on the participants that, you know, the things that they design are, are having a massive impact on the quality of life for thousands and thousands of people. Back with the design director of Xbox. Well, I'm super excited with the outcome of the sprint. One of the projects that we came up with from the design sprint is basically including emojis in the virtual keyboard. Which allows deaf or hard of hearing players to understand the emotional context in which text-based communications are made. So the virtual keyboard is something that appears system-wide, and this would be something that deaf gamers would be able to convey that certain level of emotion that they may not have been able to do beforehand. One way that the inclusive design sprint really made a direct impact uh, was thinking about how we expand the tags or, or sort of the, the standards that would govern these different clubs or these different parties. One of the features that we're talking about bringing to the console, the PC app, mobile app this holiday season is actually something called the clubs. The idea is that, uh, you know, in this example, you're getting together with other deaf gamers. Um, and, you know, this is just one, one particular example, but you could congregate around any sort of interest or, or common you know, element that you might have with other people. The bottom line around it is the even though these social and emotional needs were specific to deaf gamers uh, in the, with the Xbox console, um, the, these are um, social needs that everyone experiences. I think I, ideally the more that we do these types of things, the more that people see us doing these types of things, um, the easier it will get. You know, I think it's already clear that Microsoft, as a culture, uh, does value all humans. Uh, certainly, them taking the lead, Microsoft, on accessibility for customers with disability, and them doing that as they have been is enormous. We just can't afford to have things that are that important inaccessible to a huge percentage of the population. A team works behind closed glass doors. The screen reads, Inclusive, a Microsoft Design Toolkit. WDG video. Great, so hopefully that gives you a little more information about kind of accessible versus inclusive. Um, we're very proud of the work that came out of that as well. And you can see some of these things that may seem simple, like, oh, put emojis on a keyboard, really can come out of something like that in terms of something for a smaller audience. You know it's going to have an impact on a bigger audience, which we're going to talk about later as well. So that was kind of the first insight to think more about inclusive versus accessible. Uh, then the next one is just who, who are we talking about when we talk about accessible versus inclusive? Everybody has a different definition. We talk about different abilities. This is more about scope. One thing we learned is quickly you have to scope this once you start talking to people. So there are really four main categories we think about, uh, vision, mobility, hearing, and speech. Now, there are more than this. You can think about um, cognitive. There's some other things that people like to talk about, absolutely. But in many cases, when you're talking about your gamer audience, uh, if you start off with these four, you're going to go a long way. So traditionally, you would think of these as well, blind and wheelchair or paralyzed, uh, deaf and mute. And that kind of brings us to our next insight, which is these abilities are not binary. So there are a range of abilities. Someone uh, in a wheelchair is just on one end of that range. They, ha they have a serious permanent mobility problem. 
Um, but you can imagine there are tons of other people that have different kind of problems. So one quote that we love, uh, this was a participant. We went to their home. We had them do kind of an out-of-box study for Xbox, for the Xbox One. And it was fantastic because there was no guide dog. There was no cane. She didn't talk about herself as being blind, but she had very low vision. So in conversation, uh, you were talking to her normally. And then as she started unboxing and using the product, she did it very much the same way we would do. But instead of doing it at arm's length or sitting on the couch, she had everything right up to her face, I mean, just right up to her eyes because her vision was so low. And in this case, she's specifically saying, well, look, I'm not blind enough to need narrator, which is a screen reader, or any kind of tool, any kind of assistive technology, but she just has a low level of vision and cannot see the screen from far away. So her whole home, anything she was interacting with technology was all set up to be extremely close to the screen. So as we go through this, when we, we talk about low vision, that we're really talking about that range. And of course, that applies to hearing and mobility and uh, speech as well. So one of the next insights, besides being a range of abilities that someone has, there's also this temporal aspect. And this was a real epiphany for me. So if you look in the upper left, we'll just go through one example of having a mobility issue. We certainly talk to gamers and work with gamers that are missing limbs, that have you know, only use of one hand, right? So you can imagine that you could design a controller or design a UI or even design a game that can only be played with one hand. And you would think, yeah, but really, what, how many gamers are going to have that issue? But then you start to think about more of the temporary uh, problem with your abilities, right? So I think everybody in here has probably been in a cast, in a sling, either for a couple of weeks or a couple of days. I know I have. Um, so now you're thinking about, oh, I just want to start Netflix, or I just want to do something and navigate with one hand because this other one's in a sling. And you can imagine that circle of a tiny group of gamers with, who have lost a limb. Now you have a broader set of gamers who just have a temporary issue. And then, of course, situational, so a new parent, uh, the other one is great is you've got a drink in your hand, you've got your hand in the Cheetos, right? You want to just do things with one hand because you've, you've only got one hand at the moment. Um, you can think about trying to open a door, do something where you only have one hand available. Everybody will hit this scenario, you know, in some part of their day, their week, their month. Um, so again, you can, go, you can go around and see the examples from the different types of abilities, but this will really, hopefully will help you think that you're not just addressing this tiny group of people. You're addressing people who have permanent, temporary or situational problems with their abilities. So the next one we learned uh, was that, uh, and I love this because it's printed outside on our buildings. We have a bunch of these printed around, really trying to change the culture. Um, but the idea that 70% of disabilities are invisible to the eye. Right? So again, I look out in this audience. I don't see anyone in a wheelchair. I don't see anyone with a guide dog. But I'm sure there are people out there right now having a hard time seeing this slide who have low vision, or who have hearing aids that you know, may be a little subtle, you can't see them. Um, again, no one in a wheelchair, but I'm sure that you've got people have back issues. People can't sit here for the next two hours because their knees are going to hurt. Uh, you may have full use of your hands, but again, you may have some kind of arthritis or something that I wouldn't even know about. So it's, once you're even just looking at a group of people or actually talking to a group of people, it doesn't mean you understand their abilities. So as you're doing your interviews, as you're talking to folks, even if you're not doing this kind of work, Add a few questions. Talk to them about their abilities. How's your vision? How's your motor skills? Um, you know, try to understand their level of hearing or if they have any issues with those. This is a great one, too. This is the next thing we learned is using people first language. So what we say is important. How we talk to people is important. You know, we're sitting in front of a bunch of researchers, trying to build rapport with participants, build empathy. How we label things, all of that is very important. And what we've found is that Within this community, they're really pushing for a people-first language. And what that means, as a short example, is instead of saying, well, you're a deaf gamer, it's you're a gamer with deafness. And hopefully that resonates because a deaf gamer makes it sound like, well, I'm deaf and I happen to play games. And really we want to be thinking about, well, I'm a gamer, I'm a person, I'm a mom, I'm a whatever who happens to be deaf. And this isn't coming from us. This is coming you know, from the community. Uh, this is an article I grabbed that talks about it that I, I recommend you go read. But we've seen it firsthand that it, it helps build empathy with the participants you're talking to, with the team members and members of that community. But also, it's a nice little subtle mind shift to remember that these are people, these are gamers, these are fans, these are people who want to have great experience, who happen to have some level of ability. The last one I'm going to talk about before Lauren comes up is this idea of starting small and having a big impact. And again, I hope this is something that resonates because in many cases, we start out looking at a small group of people, find their issues and then look for solutions. Once we have those solutions, we try to think, well, who else is this going to impact, right? 
the world of accessibility and inclusivity is filled with these. I just picked this one in terms of the curb cutouts. So originally the curb cutouts uh, were designed for wheelchair access and were part of the American with Disabilities Act. But if you've ever pushed a stroller across the street, used a bicycle, carried a wheelie bag behind you like a lot of us have done in the last couple of days, you know the curb cutouts are used by everyone all the time in all kinds of different situations, right? So here's something very specific that was done um, for mobility issues that now everybody gets to enjoy. It's actually very difficult to think about if we didn't have those right now, how much of a pain it would be for all of us in this room. Um, there's plenty of examples with gaming. We talked about the emoji keyboard. If you've used an elite controller with some of the uh, controller mapping, a lot of that was around expert gamers and esports and all that, but there was also a big push from the accessibility side of the house to say, well, if I don't have the right level of mobility in this hand, I want to be able to take that trigger and put it over on the other trigger. Um, and that's why we're pushing it more and more, not even just for the elite controller, but for the, you know, a lot of our other devices uh, to give people who can't use the thing exactly the way it is more customization to move the buttons around. And again, there's really, it'd be great, we could do a whole talk on things like bendy straws, electric toothbrushes, there's a whole list of things designed, uh, you know, some of the doorknobs, and you can see those bars on the door there to easily push out, all designed around mobility issues that now we just take for granted. So those are some of the insights on kind of the people and the process. I think the best way to sum that section of the talk off is talking about how wide is your perspective, right? We tend to sit down and think I have a game and I have a gamer. Those are the people I'm going to, are going to test with and run studies on. They're going to have a full set of abilities. If you could come out of anything with this talk is to just open up your perspective, think about here's the group I usually work with. Let me add a few more people that have different sets of abilities. Let me think about how people with those abilities are going to experience my game. And now I'm going to hand it over to Lauren who's going to come talk more specifically about games and UIs and how you can integrate some of this into your product. Thank you, Tom. Hello, everyone. So I just want to switch gears and talk a little bit about some guidelines. So we've learned a lot as the Xbox platform and across other Microsoft products um, to kind of inform some guidelines to help improve the accessibility of games for everyone. So don't freak out. There's a lot of information on here. I'm going to talk through every one of these guidelines. And I see some people taking photos. This is the opportunity to take the photo of the slide. So first up, provide an immersive gaming experience with multiple senses. I think games are already really good at doing this. Games are visual medium. They have auditory components and sometimes tactile components. So on the screen here, I have an image from the game Forza. And you can see that there are raindrops hitting the windshield. So you have the visual indication of the rain hitting the car. And then you also have the kind of pitter patter noise of rain hitting the windshield. And then also, you know, if you're playing this on a controller, you have maybe the controller is handling a little bit differently. The car is driving differently because you're driving on a wet road. So imagine there are three different media for you to convey that experience in your game through these different senses. Give control to your gamers. Um, this is you know, something that I think also some games are really good at doing. You know, think of someone that has low vision and they want to read the subtitles of a cutscene again. Or you know, think of someone that has low mobility that knows that they're never going to be able to complete this boss um, because they just don't have the dexterity to press all those buttons at just the right time, but they still want to play the rest of the game. So you know, these seem like separate requests, but this is really about the same idea of giving control um, to the gamers to experience the game at their own pace. And here's just an example of how that kind of control can manifest in a game. This is a screenshot from Gears of War 4. And you can see that there are different acts or uh, sections of the game that you can kind of go in, play, replay, et cetera. Um, and this is just giving players the control to play the game at their own pace. This is a very long quote. I'm not going to read it. This is from Turn 10, the studio that created Forza. They started getting a little bit of feedback from people that the driving lines or the kind of driving assist lines um, weren't visible to some players. And they heard this feedback and realized, wow, the, the colors are actually off. Some people that have color blindness won't be able to see these. So they took the extra step and changed these. And it actually ended up helping not just that original audience of people that had color blindness, but it helped a larger group of people. And here's an example of that. Let me get the video to play.
Okay, so you can see here that there are these, the chevron or the kind of arrow point um, shapes, and it goes from this like gradual blue color to this yellow color to this red color. Red being the, oh my God, slow down, you're gonna crash if you don't slow down it um, around this corner. And you know, they originally had this as a green color, which to some folks is actually not visible. So just by changing this, they made the game more inclusive to a larger group of people. Four point five to one contrast ratio. This is one of my favorites. Um, this is a graph of the Xbox color scheme, and the outline in red are actually failures that break this contrast ratio minimum. Um, so you can see, or hopefully you probably can't see, that going from the upper left corner to the lower right corner, the color and the contrast between the text of the font and the background is not sufficient. So there are certain items that are just completely lost or invisible based on that contrast ratio. And here's how this can manifest in a game. So on the left, this is from Halo. I just took a screenshot. Um, so right in the middle of the screen, there are uh, some crates and like a little platform. And after doctoring up the image a little bit and playing around with the contrast, the image on the right is with the kind of experience of having a, an inability to distinguish contrast efficiently. And you can see that a lot of the elements that all of those artists spent so many hours detailing and designing are now completely invisible. So this, the screen on the right could be something that someone sees just normally. Um, so fortunately, if you are able to see the screen on the left without any issue, um, this is just what it would kind of manifest for some people that have visual issues. Font size and color. Um, this is one piece of feedback. If I were stuck in an elevator with any one of you, this is the one that I would probably talk about the most. Um, font sizes are too small. Font sizes are too small. <laughs> Um, the example that I have up here is from the amazing movie Toy Story, it's awesome, um, and the subtitles are turned on. So even though you know, Toy Story is a very rich, colorful, animated movie, the subtitles are still visible based on that contrast ratio and also based on the size. So the, the font size, is or excuse me, the subtitles are taking up approximately a fourth of the screen, which is sufficient enough for uh, most people to be able to read those. Perfect time to take a break. Um, on the flip side of that, this is Gears of War 4. Um, I'm not bashing on Gears of War 4 too hard. Um, I know the researcher that works on that team. Um, this is a screenshot that I took directly from the game. On my Xbox, I didn't change the ratio or anything like that. These are the actual subtitles that appear in the game. And you can see, or maybe you can't see, that they are taking up about a 16th of the screen, so much, much smaller than Toy Story. As you know, TV screens get better resolution, 4K, pixels are getting more pixely. Um, there's a big push with designers, I think, to, to really create more visual and intense images. And at, sometimes this is at the cost of font sizes, such as subtitles. Caption everything. Caption, everything. Um, so the previous two slides that I just showed were about subtitles. And uh, for those of you that do not know the difference between captions and subtitles, I am going to explain it to you. Um, so subtitles are just a way for dialogue to be portrayed in text. So characters are speaking, something is happening. It's just the audio text of what is being spoken. Um, captions do that and more. Um, captions also include the tone of voice. Is someone yelling? Is someone whispering? Um, they also include sound effects. Is there a dog barking? Is there a car horn? Um, they also include kind of the emotionality of the music that's playing. So is there scary violin music playing? Or is there kind of this subdued bassy music playing? So it's just a way to convey more information about what is happening in the game if you do not have the ability to hear. Um, this is just another example. This is from uh, TV show Scrubs, if you've seen it. Um, this is just a way to convey another kind of sound effect um, and how that would manifest in a closed caption type setting. And also note the contrast of the font. Um, so live TV is already really good at doing this. Um, Netflix is actually starting to do this. If you've kind of played around the subtitle sections of Netflix, um, they're starting to include more closed captioning on more of their programming. 
Um, you know, and coming back to inclusive design like Tom was talking about, uh, you know, this is not something that should be considered an accessible feature. You know, imagine if you are in a loud bar and you can't hear what is going on, but you still want to know what is being said. Um, you know, imagine if English is your second language and you just need an additional component to be able to understand what is being said on the TV. Or imagine if you are a parent and you have a sleeping kid in the next room and you cannot play the audio, but you still really want to know what is going on in the game or movie or TV show. So this is not just for people with low hearing. Um, this is just another example. Um, I have a couple examples of captioning. Um, this is from the game Half-Life 2, and this is a way to distinguish the different speakers that are, uh, that are talking in the game or the TV show. Um, the text on the upper part in the italics is this kind of voiceover or narration that's happening in the game. And then the text on the bottom in the kind of regular font is what is being said by the actual characters in the game. Separate audio channels. Um, so I have an actual video here that I'm going to play a couple minutes a um, couple minutes in and then I'm actually going to jump around and play several more minutes in the video. Um, so for some context, um, there is a gamer who's blind, his uh, gamer tag is Sightless Combat. He is a phenomenal Killer Instinct player. I think he's blown a lot of competitions out of the water. Um, so I just want to play a couple minutes of this video. This is something that he threw up on YouTube. I'll have the link at the end of the presentation. Um, but this is just him talking about how he is able to play Killer Instinct as a 100% blind gamer. Hello everybody, I am Sightless Combat, and this is my first commentary-centric video on YouTube. This is a video focusing on how I, as a totally blind player with absolutely no sight whatsoever, actually tackle Killer Instinct as a game. Not completely, because that would take a lot of time, but just the basics of how you yourself can get involved in playing this as a blindfolded player, if you have a vision of any sort and as a non-visually impaired player if you don't have any vision. So <laughs> hopefully that makes sense. So the key thing you'll notice at the moment is that the music is up. Now as good as Mick Gordon's soundtracks are and as good as Alice Plug and Cell Dwellers soundtracks are going to be once we get to hear them in the game, we're going to have to turn these down for this experiment. Not experiment, but this video. Out into the main menu so if I go into options go down four I've learned these by heart into audio options and then we go down four again we have the music slider now we will turn that actually I'm gonna leave that up while I explain this there is a slider above the music slider that I've just said about called HUD volume now if I move to the right you hear that noise which means it's all the way up I was partially responsible for this slider being in the game myself because middle of season two I actually went onto the Ultra Combo forums and basically said look guys online I am dropping so many combos it is ridiculous uh, here's a bunch of suggestions I have for making this better for visually impaired players and those were particularly those with no sight at all who can't see the KV meter and the shadow meter because at the time I was just having to guess when I had shadow meter and guess when I was going to drop a combo. So that was very frustrating. After a bunch of the community rallied around me and were very kind and basically said this would be a good idea and one individual decided to troll the thread and basically be a bit of a pain. I uh, can't remember exactly what was said but I believe it was implied that the people that that person had worked with who were blind hadn't played video games and it wasn't the done thing. I think that was the implication though I can't specifically remember so don't quote me on that. So after that all happened and the community did rally round me, I was surprised a few patches later that the developers sneaked in without any of us realising they were going to do it. They sneaked in a sound update where it said in the patch notes, I'll see if I can link it in the description of the video, they said added audio cues for KV meter, 
shadow meter and eventually they added I don't know if it was in that update or whether it was in a later one they added cues for cinders burnout enders as well so you knew when they were affecting you it makes it as you feel a little better when he connects those as well because you know your your limbs are on fire which is rather interesting Okay, so I'm going to jump around uh, to a little bit more. He goes into a little bit more depth about this, but I want to kind of demonstrate what he's actually talking about after he goes in and changes some of these audio settings. Let's see. Right about... Stop doing that. We're going to be up on Khan Ra. Actually, you'll notice each character has a sound. <laughs> That's Maya. We've got TJ. We got Riptor, Rarrr. We got Omen. We got Argonos, who seems to take a while to load, and let's not go through all those. Might do that in a separate video, maybe. So we're gonna beat up on Khan Ra. Khan -ra! Fight on. So now this uh, just loads. So basically, the way it works, I'm gonna suggest before we start that you put stereo headphones on so that you can get the full effect of this. Make sure they're around the right way as well, that's very handy. These intros with that music still sound good. You make a fine specimen. No, you sure? Titles. Okay. Fight. So, you can hear Fulgore making noise on the left hand side. Now, if I press back to block, Oh, and the little noise is my shadow meter going up. You'll hear it again in a minute. And then if I hold, so this is backwards, and if I hold forward as well, I walk forward. And there's the shadow meter again. So if I now crouch, and if I crouch again, and let go, crouch, let go, there's a sound. Like that. Now if I jump, so that's just the neutral. If I jump back, you can hear that pans if I jump forward. You can also hear that pans if I jump all the way from the left hand side of the screen to the right hand side of the screen. Like that. And if I jump all the way to the left. There we go. Now if I teleport, it will still move as well. So if I do quarter circle back and right trigger, I will end up behind Khan Ra. Oh, hang on, get yeah, my inputs right. There we go, and if I do quarter circle back and light kick, on this side, I will flip to the left-hand side of the screen where I was before. And then if I do quarter circle back and medium kick, I will go into the sort of middle of the screen-ish. And then if I do quarter circle back and kick again, ow, I will just end up hitting Khan Ra because I got my inputs wrong. There we go. I still moves slightly inwards. So if I now teleport back to this side. Now, uh, one last thing as well. Uh, spacing is a, a thing that you just get used to. So move like, oh, dashes as well have sounds, so. You get, you get the idea. So, um, ah, that little noise means you can use your devastation beam more commonly referred to as the hype beam which makes this noise Extreme. giant red laser okay so i just wanted to end with that so just remember that he is a completely blind gamer and he was creating that video as a demonstration of how he's able to play this game um, with the ability to kind of change the audio settings in the game and turn down that amazing music um, and just be able to hear a little bit more of the sound effects of what was going on, especially with the HUD meter that he was talking about. Um, and I actually, I forgot to mention, I apologize. I tried very, very hard to get the closed captions to sh show up for that video. Um, I could not for the life of me figure out how to do that and embed it from YouTube. Um, so I have a link to the video, so if you would like to see it with closed captions, um, there's a link on the resource slide that will show at the end. Um, okay, so second to last one that I wanted to talk through. Um, this is all about uh, having a screen reader or narrator. Um, this is something that a lot of folks talking to gamers that are familiar with screen readers or voiceovers or narrators, um, those are all basically talking about the same thing. 
Um, this is something that they're starting to expect in a lot of devices. So um, Windows, Apple TV, phones, et cetera, all of those products have this kind of feature already. And this is just something that is basically expected on a TV experience, hence on with games. So you know, you're probably thinking, well, why would someone that is blind play Halo? And you know, back to Tom's point with that quote, just imagine that someone might not be able to completely see the text on the screen, but they're able to still play the game. So this is a kind of feature that would allow someone to be able to navigate through the UI of the menu to actually start playing the game in the first place. Um, so I don't have a video from this, but um, you can imagine that if I had a screen reader turned on for this setting, um, you know, it would read out, you know, item one of one, or excuse me, one of four, you know, start playing the game, item two of four, um, audio settings or things like that. So it would basically just read through the text that was appearing in the user interface. Um, so the last one that I have is about communication. Um, this is a basically another way of saying speech to text, text to speech, a feature to allow people to communicate in games. Um, we've heard a lot of feedback that people struggle with party chat features, um, especially on the Xbox. Um, you know, we've heard some pretty negative horror stories um, of people getting kicked out of party chats, getting uninvited to raids, and just basically losing out on the multiplayer experience because they're not able to keep up on the communication party chat um, situation with other gamers. Um, you know, we also know that a lot of these gamers go over to play on PC because it's just easier to play games on PC with the ability to type out uh, text on a keyboard and so forth. So this is just something that we're really pushing for um, as a platform and over, you know, across the way at GDC, this is something that is being discussed right now with developers, um, that there is a mechanism that we are providing as a platform um, so that if you are creating games for Xbox, that there is an ability to leverage this. So the big picture, um, you know, we've, I've walked through a lot of guidelines, Tom walked through a lot of the um, the kind of what and why this is happening um, for us as researchers and us as a larger company. Um, you know, we're, we're all about the user. We're all about the experience. Um, you know, we're trying to make our products or services or games, et cetera, better for people. Um, but, you know, I really challenge everyone to, to really think outside of those walls and try to think about hitting a larger audience and realizing that, you know, some of the things that you could be changing or little tiny things are not just targeted at a very specific audience, but they can impact a very a bigger audience, a much larger audience. You know, if you worked on any type of web or PC communication, um, you know that there are standards for doing this already. And as a platform with games, this is something that we know that is coming down the, down the line. Um, and it's something that we should probably start paying attention to. So a little bit of a recency effect. If there's anything I want you to remember, just remember these three slides. Um, so first off, just you know, think about inclusion versus accessibility. Um, you know, think about what Tom was saying about the temporary, situational, permanent issues that some people face. Um, you know, what if you were to play your game? What if you played your game without sound? What would that experience be like? Um, what if part of your screen were blurry? What would that experience be like? Second, um, you know, if there are many researchers out there, which I think most of you are, um, actually talk to these people. Um, they are very, very willing to provide feedback, um, and they are willing to talk about this. Um, they're a very engaged audience. Um, I know a lot of the people that we talk to are ecstatic that, number one, you know, we're listening, and that, number two, we are trying to actually improve something. Um, so, you know, I've had a lot of people come up to me and ask, well, how, how do I go do that? Um, you know, I'd recommend reaching out to the communities. Um, I think most areas have some kind of blind association or deaf community association um, where they gather as a community and meet and talk about job opportunities and resources that are available to them. So they are out there. And I would just encourage everyone to just go and talk to them and try to get one person in your study and just talk to you to see what their experience is like. And lastly, you know, just go through your experience and just see what little things you can change. And if anything, make the font size bigger. <laughs> That's all I ask. If one person goes out of here and makes the font size bigger, I will consider this talk an absolute success. Um, you know, so think about like the door handle uh, that Tom mentioned. Um, it's little things like that where you would think, well, why, why should we have a different door handle? But you realize, oh, well, 
yeah, if I am holding a beer or a baby, it is easier for me to open the door this way. So just think about those kinds of um, opportunities you can do to change your game or your product, whatever you're working on. Um, so I'm going to leave the resources slide up here for a while. I also threw up um, Tom and my contact information. Um, we have several minutes to answer questions, and I think Tom and I would be more than happy to answer questions. Um, I want to point out the very first link up there is uh, the Design Sprint Toolkit, and that is a publicly available resource that all of you can use. Um, if you want to use it as an individual or take it back to your team, um, this is the ability to kind of walk through the different exercises of what is a temporary situational, permanent disability kind of thing look like. Um, so there's a lot of resources there to kind of jog your mind um, and get in, into this mindset of doing this kind of stuff. Um, and then third from the bottom, there's the link to the, um, the YouTube video with the sightless combat player that I showed earlier. Um, and if you do need subtitles, um, there are subtitles embedded in YouTube, so I apologize about that. Um, but if you also just search for Silas Combat, you should be able to find uh, some of his other stuff, because I think he's done a couple videos. Um, yeah, and then I have a bunch of other statistics stuff up here as well, um, where I got a lot of those numbers that were showing up on the slides. Um, yeah, I think I'll stop right there, and if anyone has any questions, um, we can answer them now, or otherwise just come find Tom or myself uh, throughout the rest of the day. Um, thank you, guys. Oh, really? <laughs> uh, thank you for this. I think it's super awesome. I actually noticed recently in a bunch of newer games that in the settings there was a colorblind mode that mm -hmm. was added in. Um, so you mentioned that this is kind of a push that you're going for. Um, how are you, uh, what kind of steps are you taking in order to push this out to all developers in order to get these kinds of things in games? Um, so a couple of different things. Um, I think first off, if you kind of think about this as a platform versus a content, um, that can really help divide the conversation a little bit more. So as a platform, we're really trying to drive in a lot of those features and basically create the foundation for developers to access this kind of stuff. Um, so you know, I mentioned the speech to text, um, narrator, um, high contrast, I'm trying to think, uh, magnifier. So those kinds of things are available as a platform, like system-wide kind of thing. Um, but the thing that is kind of slowly starting to catch up with us is actually with the content. Um, so you know, the example that I showed with Killer Instinct, that was not something that was explicitly like, oh, we need to do an accessible thing. We'll do this thing. Um, it was just something that they just happened to do. So it wasn't a like, hey, we need to go make this thing. Let's let's implement this somehow from some like systematic way. It was just something that they changed. And I think that was also the th example from Forza as well. But that was a little bit more directed from a specific audience. Um, so you know, as far as you know, how to kind of get this in there, I think if you want to look at it from a systematic way of well, let's just start with one thing being font size. Um, let's start with that and then kind of go from there um, and see where that takes us. Because I know that, um, you know, especially for smaller houses, doing a lot of this kind of stuff can be incredibly expensive and just get squeezed out of the budget and squeezed out of the timeline. Um, so it's really kind of about finding those little, kind, little things that can be really tackled um, to just make a bigger impact down the road. Anything else? Oh, okay. This is great. Um, I really appreciate you guys giving this talk. Um, what is advice that you have maybe for researchers who are trying to be advocates for um, players with disabilities and getting more inclusive game design in, um, like moving forward? I mean, it's, this is like an awesome list of resources, but how can we convey that to our dev teams that this is a really important thing that we need to be taking into consideration? Yeah, um, so the, the video that uh, Tom showed in his section of the presentation about the design sprint, that was something that was actually done not just with like a group of researchers, but there were devs, PMs, designers, um, plus a researcher in the room. So it was really a group effort, and I think the word of the day is probably empathy. Um, you know, once you start getting those subject matter experts in there, and you start talking to a gamer that wants to play your game but can't for some reason, um, I think it's that kind of thing, like starting small um, with an individual that can probably be a little bit more effective than just throwing out a bunch of stats around, oh, well, millions of people have this, millions of people have that. 
Um, that gets, I think, a little lost. Um, but if you actually have an individual face to put through the issue, I think that can really help drive that point home. Um, I would also, not to kind of uh, wave the Microsoft flag too hardly, but I would really recommend checking out the toolkit, that link on the top. Um, there's just a lot of good stuff in there that you can use, um, you know, do printouts or on screens or whatever um, with your team to kind of walk through different sections um, of, you know, this is what the experience would look like if someone has a permanent or temporary or situational disability. Um, and I think it just kind of opens up more people's minds to what is going on and gets rid of this barrier of, oh, well, we're not just thinking about blind, we're not just thinking about deaf, um, but we're kind of opening up to more people. Um, do you have anything to add? Yeah, the only, the only thing I was gonna add there is this second one here. So it seems like tackling this is a big uh, roadblock, like I have to run a study or I have to build up this recruiting, but we've gotten so much buy-in from just having one or two people show up. You don't even have to tell the team, right? Just run your six sessions, add a seventh or an eighth, and start showing them the videos and have them come into the lab, and we, we get a ton of traction just from that. Um, and there's really no like approval or no giant budget ask, it's just getting a few folks in. And as Lauren mentioned, in many cases, they are kind of formed around communities and more than happy to come in. So they, they love doing it as well. Thank you so much for the talk. Very, very good. Yeah, thanks. Um, I was wondering, you were talking about design sprints. I wonder how do you use design sprints on your work with other team members and, and in your work in general? Um, yeah, the design sprints were, um, you know, as I was just mentioning before, it's uh, one of the big reasons of doing that is to get the team on um, the same page that are coming from different disciplines. Um, so, you know, maybe a designer is not really thinking about that. They're thinking about, oh my gosh, I want the pixels to be beautiful. Um, you know, just getting everybody on the same page, I think, is the biggest point of having the design sprint. Um, whether you are working on the exact same product or, you know, as at Microsoft, there's many, many different things that people are working on. Um, but just getting everyone on the same page, I think, is the most efficient way and most effective way um, to get that across. There's one more, yeah. So you talked a lot about the uh, visual and the audio issues for accessibility, mm -hmm. but um, one of the biggest issues that a lot of people have with games is the controller itself mm -hmm. and being unable to use it. You were talking a little bit about one-handed. Um, how much are you able to work around the limitations of having to use an Xbox One controller or having to use a keyboard and mouse and things like that? Like how much design work can go into that and how much mm -hmm. of that has to be sort of a limitation of the medium? Back to one thing that Tom brought up with the Elite controller. Um, the solving for a one-handed controller is very, very, very difficult. Um, I think the the initial design of the Xbox controller was obviously designed for two hands that are a certain size and that have a certain amount of dexterity to be able to grip it and reach the buttons and press the buttons and all of that. Um, so I think the you know leaning a little bit more on the um, on the Elite controller and the flexibility to be able to button map. And I know that a lot of games also do this, where you're able to um, you know swap the default mapping to something else. Um, so it's that kind of thing that gets a little bit closer. Um, to be able to kind of solve for that issue, but it is very, very difficult, and I think that's why um, there are a lot of um, gamers that go over to PC because there's a little bit more flexibility of being able to change inputs and, you know, yes, I can have a keyboard over here and I can map certain keys to do these certain features in the, um, in the game, um, but I don't have a better answer. It's, it is a very tough question, but I think the Elite Controller and the ability to um, not only like change the mapping of everything, but change the different types of buttons. So if you're familiar with it, um, there's different like paddle sizes that you can use and um, longer thumbsticks and shorter thumbsticks and all that kind of stuff. There's, so there's more flexibility to be able to use the controller more in different ways. Yeah. Talk about co oh, yeah. No, no, go for it. Yeah, okay. I was also saying we're allowed to talk about this feature, so I guess it's Yeah, right. sorry, I was being uh, overly cautious. Um, <laughs> so there is uh, a feature that Xbox released somewhat recently um, called Copilot Mode. Um, this is the ability to, um, a platform feature to be able to essentially split one controller input into two controllers. Um, so not like player one's controller and player two's controller, but player one has two controllers. Um, so you know, imagine the situation of um, a parent that wants to be able to do all the fine dexterous movements of 
like actually moving the player around and everything else, but there's a kid or someone else that has limited mobility that only has the ability to just like press one button, but they still want to play the game, but there's just too much involved in playing the game. So Copilot allows that controller to be able to have the dexterity of being able to move, and then a separate controller that just has one button. So every button on the controller is just jump, or every button is just shoot. Um, so it allows two people to play um, at the same time. Hopefully I explained that pretty clear. That was really fast. But um, yeah, that's another, another way to kind of solve that problem for the one-handed controller issue. Yeah. Uh, thanks, guys. That was a fantastic talk. The, um, when we develop for first party, we know that uh, it comes with a host of compliance issues. Do you see a day where Microsoft might want to make a lot of these um, part of the compliance of developing for Xbox? I could see that happening. Um, I don't know specifics of that being a like kind of thunder um, hand coming down saying you must do this. Um, I could certainly see that happening though. Um, you know, if we kind of pay attention to the legal history around the um, Americans with Disabilities Act, that kind of stuff. Um, and also a lot of the standards that I know the government has to abide by as far as um, like accessibility for documents and that kind of stuff. So if you're kind of paying attention and assume that, oh, well, that kind of stuff that happened is probably going to happen um, at some point, I could, I could actually see that happening, but I don't know anything for sure. Yeah. Anything else? So thank you again. This this is awesome stuff. Sure. Uh, so I'm kind of curious. This is a little uh, geared towards uh, console, which obviously has like a, a lot of opportunity. Mm -hmm. um, from a mobile developer, I'm kind of curious, uh, kind of on two fronts, how well you think this translates into the the mobile world, particularly like the phone, um, or kind of what would you think is like the biggest area of improvement that needs to happen as far as like uh, like you know smartphone accessibility mm -hmm. or inclusive design. Sure. Uh, I think for mobile, the, the biggest issue is the actual touch screen interface itself. Um, you know, having talked to a lot of folks in the lab, one of their biggest complaints is with, um, you know, this kind of modern push towards technology to go towards touch screens. Um, and one example that comes immediately to mind um, are, <clears throat> excuse me, are things like um, the stove and the microwave where buttons have now become kind of flush with the surface and you don't know if you've pressed the button, especially if you can't hear anything. Um, so there's no like kind of tactile feedback of, okay, I've pushed this thing. Oh wait, I don't know if I've pushed this thing. And obviously you can imagine that that happens on a touch screen. Um, so that's where I think, you know, focusing on just the kind of visual and auditory stuff, that's where mobile, I think, really has to amp it up a little bit um, because you don't have the, um, the flexibility to deal with a lot of that tactile stuff. Um, I know I'm actually an iPhone user, but I think Android, I think, has the ability to do this where there's um, uh, the ability to like, dif create different buzzes and so forth. Um, so that's probably one step going towards, you know, just getting feedback of, oh, yes, I press this button and there's some kind of persistent feedback that happens. Um, but yeah, as far as um, different types of input mechanisms, I think I've seen different like plugins for phones that have like buttons for gaming and that kind of stuff. Like that's probably a little bit closer. Um, but I don't think that solves for the issue of it just being a touch screen itself. Um, yeah. Anything else? Okay, cool. Um, yeah, so Tom and I will be around all day, so if you think of anything else, just feel free to come and talk to us. Um, thank you again.